I should be absolutely ashamed of myself. Owning a channel like this and the one review I did not have on here was any kind of review of the SM57. How dare I? Well, to be honest, I've owned several of these over the years. Most of them have been lost, stolen, or ended up like this one, used oh so well. This is broken, by the way. Recently, I decided to buy a new one, something I've actually never done. I've always bought them used. And along with that, I got the presidential pop filter as well, just to try it out, as I've never used that either. So then, let's take a look at the SM57 and this Shure A2WS, and why it's the only mic you're ever going to need. And how it became the only mic the presidents have used since it's been released. Now, the reason these microphones are so well regarded and used by the US government is mil-spec. That is the term used for gear that is built to spec for military use, and the SM series of microphones are no different. This is one of the nearly indestructible microphones that they've released, and people have done everything to test the metal of these mics, including hammering nails. Now, if you want to see me try my hand at something like that, let me know. I think it's in the cards, so get subscribed so you don't miss that. Now, it's got a hefty design on the body, and unlike the SM58, you can't just unscrew the capsule cover here. There is a way to do it, though I've never found a reason to do it, so I'm not going to bother with it here. Uh, this thing does include the Unidyne capsule that is famous across Shure's lineup, though with each iteration has a unique tuning to slightly set it apart from each other. Like the SM58, it does have a transformer, and in terms of sound, it's the closest to the SM58 profile, though again, even like with the SM7B, all three mics are close together in sound. However, there is no pop protection on this thing, which is why it's quite useful to get the very specific clown nose for it, or really any clown nose will help. This one in particular though, the A2WS, does complete the aesthetic look if you want that truly presidential look. It simply slides over top and is tightened with a flathead screw here. Now all this talk about mil spec though, you should know that this thing is plastic and it won't be taking the same level of abuse as the mic itself, so keep that in mind if you're rough with your equipment. This thing is a dynamic cardioid microphone. It's 40 hertz to 15 kilohertz. Sensitivity of neg 56 dBV per pascal, which is exactly the same as the SM58. It has a weight of 0.625 pounds, and here's the frequency response compared to the SM58. You will notice a bit more detail on the top end of the graph, which is apparently called a carefully contoured presence rise. Now let's take a look at the off-axis rejection of the Shure SM57. This is me speaking about three inches off the front of the capsule. Now I'm speaking about three inches off the side of the capsule. And now I'm speaking about three inches off the rear of the capsule. Now let's do a plosive rejection test of the Shure SM57. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Ooh. Now let's take a look at the proximity effect test of the Shure SM57. This is me speaking approximately three inches off the front of the capsule. Now I'm directly on top of the capsule. Three inches, directly on top. Now we're gonna do a handling noise test of the Shure SM57. And this is what these microphones tend to be really well known for. Their handling noise isn't horrendous. And when you compare this to a lot of other microphones, especially stage mics, this might be a bit of an issue for others, but Shure's really perfected the shock mount in these things. And this is what it sounds like. Now we have the Shure SM57 up against the Shure SM58. And I am keeping the pop filter on just because this is going to be a poppy mess if I don't. But what do you think as I go between them? Now, we do have some non-Shure microphones after this, uh, and we're going to circle around to the SM7B at the end. But I just wanted to start out with the two SM series that really kicked it off for sure. And can you hear how it's tuned differently in that airy register? Let me know. SM57, SM58. Now we have the SM57 up against the AKG D5. And to be perfectly honest, I'm just grabbing a bunch of handheld mics off the shelf and I'm going to be throwing them up here. What do you think as I go between the SM57 and the AKG D5? I actually haven't had this one out in quite a while, so it's kind of nice to let it get out and stretch its legs. Now we have the Shure SM57 up against the SEV7. Now I do not have the SEV7X, which is kind of the counter to the SM57. I do want to get my hands on that. Maybe I'll get that in the next little bit. But this is the SM57 up against the SEV7, kind of the counter to the SM series of microphones by SE. Which one do you like? 
Now we have the SM57 kind of up against the younger brother or sister, the SM7B. You might notice they're a little bit off center and that's because the capsule in the SM7B is just a little bit further away than the tip of this. It's about an inch and a half in between the end of this microphone and the actual capsule. In this one, you can hold it back. Uh, within six inches, you wanna use the SM57, but the SM7B, you want it to be a little bit closer. And this is what it sounds like as I go between them. This is the one that has a lot of people divided on the internet. Is the SM57 that much worse or better than the SM7? Be. Do they sound relatively close in, in sound profiles? Yes, they do. The SM7B does sound different, don't get me wrong. But does it sound that much more expensive different? That's the great argument, I think. SM57, SM7B. I mean, if you want the pros, just look at the history of this thing. It has been trusted as a go-to mic by the best of the best, and to this day is considered a must-have in every musician's and studio collection. It is an absolute workhorse that doesn't need to be pampered and can withstand a lot. It's used for all kinds of instruments, from drums to woodwinds, and add to that, it's one of the most recognized sound profiles in the world. And then, of course, there's cost. This is only a hundred bucks, that's it. If you're so inclined, the pop filter here is just an extra 15. Pretty hard to argue with $115 for a mic that can do all this and still be the best or at least one of the best vocal mics ever. And the best part of the SM series is that when you're done with them, they flip on the used market for close to 90% of their new value, provided they're in decent condition. No other microphone can boast that. Now, as for any cons, I mean, there's really just the one. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Ooh. Plosives. There is a ton of hot air running past these lips, and if you're like me, that might be a bit of an issue for you. If you're looking at finding a Swiss Army knife of microphones, though, this is the absolute best possible choice for pretty much everyone. So then, we know all the good things, and there's a lot of good here. But is the idea that this mic has been the presidential mic for decades an actual selling point? Not really. I mean, it is a cool fact, no doubt, but it really only harkens back to one specific spec, and that's build quality. I mean, it does help that the mic is almost universal in its use, but I doubt Biden is rigging this up to a Marshall stack or a snare. Really, though, it does speak to its history and staying power. Nothing has ever really replaced it. And for a technology that's almost 60 years old, that's pretty impressive. Let me know though, do you think the windscreen actually sells this thing for having better aesthetics? Does it make it a worthy buy for a podcasting mic? Let me know down below. And if you missed my Sure History video, you can check it out up here. Cheers. Thanks for watching.